detail about Trevor Rees Jones. He's a bodyguard employed by the Al Fayed family who is travelling in the front of that vehicle. He has, as you say, serious injuries, serious facial injuries. He's in intensive care. His family are with him, but no, he's not on the danger list. He may be able to give more detail about what has become a rather confused incident. We've got these reports, as you've heard, of press photographers on motorbikes, either behind or around that car. Other witnesses say they saw no bikes. We may not know any more until the French police either prefer charges or issue a further statement. Robert, what about those people who we understand earlier today were arrested and, uh, and are still being held in connection with this incident, those photographers on motorbikes? Well, that's right. There were seven photographers altogether, six French photographers, one Macedonian. They were questioned throughout the day. Reports this afternoon suggested that three of them had been released, four were still being held. Now, even if the French don't prefer charges of either involuntary manslaughter or manslaughter, there is a charge uh, under a, a, a sort of so-called Good Samaritan law where people can actually be indicted for failing to help people in danger. So they may not be out of the, fire, out of the woodwork, out of, the, um, out of danger yet. Robert Hall in Paris, thank you very much. Princess Diana's most recent high-profile cause was, of course, her crusade to rid the world of landmines. It was a role which sometimes brought her into conflict with politicians, but the princess always insisted that her interest was purely humanitarian. Our Africa correspondent Steve Scott was in Angola when the princess visited that country. Dressed down and ready for work, a princess swapping glamour for a new hands-on approach to her charity work. In January, she chose war-ravaged Angola to launch this fresh image and put her face behind the Red Cross landmines campaign. The victims she met had no idea who she was. They were just glad somebody was taking notice. They found her visit uplifting. And where others would have been embarrassed, the princess was completely at ease with the serious injuries confronting her. She was, though, quite clearly moved by many of the tragic stories she listened to. At the time, the princess described the trip as humbling, with the effect of hardening her stance against anti-personnel mines. Her visit made headlines worldwide, but also sparked criticism from some British MPs who blamed her for meddling in politics. Somewhat annoyed, the princess replied she was not a politician, but a humanitarian. Always had been, always would be. The man who accompanied her in Angola said today her magic had an extraordinary effect. When uh, the Princess of Wales became involved, suddenly the interest escalated. Journalists who wrote articles about things nothing to do with landmines had to suddenly swat up on landmine issues and learn about the subject, get to know it, and report it. And we saw the reporting of landmines in some of the most obscure journals in the world. Earlier this month, she took her campaign to Bosnia, taking time to talk to those, many of them children, whose lives have been shattered by the war there. As always, focusing on the youngsters to help publicize the devastation mines have caused and the threat they still pose. The princess knew she'd be followed wherever she went, so she decided to turn that to the advantage of tens of thousands across the world who are in no position to help themselves. Steve Scott, ITN. Our correspondent Harry Smith is at Buckingham Palace. Harry, as we said, the body of the princess is on its way back to Britain now. What information can you give us about the funeral arrangements? Well, there's been no announcement as yet. I'm told that there might be an announcement later tonight, more likely tomorrow. Uh, the main question, of course, is what kind of funeral the princess will be given. Normally, members of the royal family would have a full state funeral. But, of course, the Princess of Wales lost her title, Her Royal Highness. Uh, but the royal family must be acutely aware, as uh, are most people in this country, that many, many people will want to pay their tribute to, to the princess. I'm told that the thinking at the moment seems to be that she will be given a national funeral, which might be a, a state funeral in all but name. Uh, of course, then uh, that could happen uh, towards the end of next week, perhaps Friday. More likely, however, uh, I'm told, the, the week after. But there is still, of course, the question of uh, where she'll be buried. Normally, members of the royal family would be interred uh, at uh, St George's Chapel, Windsor. She could, however, be buried at the, the family home in Northamptonshire. But I, I think we've been given a very strong signal. It was a royal standard which was draped over her coffin as, uh, as, it, left, uh, as it left France. I think that's a clear indication that... Uh, she will be given the, the, full, the full dignitary uh, of, a, of a member of the royal family. So, Harry, as you said, the possibility now of a funeral next week. Any indication of what happens between the arrival of the princess's body and then, and the funeral? 
It, I'm told it will arrive shortly at uh, RAF Northolt. It'll then be taken, uh, it'll arrive by plane, it'll then be taken to a, a private chapel. Uh, thereafter, we've been given no indication of what will happen. As I say, we are waiting for word from Buckingham Palace. Uh, there is as yet no official announcement. Harry Smith, Buckingham Palace, thank you very much. And that's the early evening news on the day the nation mourns the death of the Princess of Wales. I'll be back at 9 o'clock this evening with a special programme and we'll be going back to the continuous news team for more live coverage shortly. But first, Lauren Taylor looks back at the life of Diana, Princess of Wales. It was in February 1981 that a shy Lady Diana Spencer was officially engaged to Prince Charles. It was the start of a royal career that turned her into one of the most famous women in the world. Although she was the daughter of an aristocrat, her marriage to Prince Charles transformed her life. There was even the prospect she might one day be queen. During a ceremony that was watched all over the world, Diana's youth and beauty shone out, capturing the hearts of the nation and beyond. Her marriage appeared initially to be going well, with a first son, Prince William, born in 1982. But the pressure of such a high-profile role was beginning to show and there were rumours she was suffering from anorexia nervosa, rumours at that time denied by the palace. In 1984, a second son, Prince Harry, was born. Always under the public eye, Diana immersed herself in charity work, notably with AIDS victims, helping to destigmatize the illness. But her marriage was beginning to fall apart, and the couple separated. Although Diana vowed to continue her charity work, a series of scandals followed, the final straw came when a paper published pictures of her working out in a gym. She'd had enough. I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. The last few years of the marriage were marred by very public admissions of marital unhappiness. First, Prince Charles admitted on television he'd been unfaithful. Then came Diana's panorama program. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> but the interview also allowed her to explain what she wanted to be. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. I'd like to be an ambassador for this country. I'd like to represent this country abroad. As I have all this media interest, let's not just sit in this country and be battered by it. Let's take them, these people, out and to represent this country and the good qualities of it abroad. Since her divorce in August 1996, Diana had increasingly succeeded in that role of international ambassador for good causes. Here she walked through a field of landmines in Angola to publicize their dangers. Leading humanitarian figures recognised her ability to generate support for previously obscure issues. Her recent friendship with Dodi Al Fayed brought her companionship but kept her in the headlines too. In recent months, Diana appeared to have found happiness again, her charm and charisma as ever winning over those who met her. Lauren Taylor, ITN. Good evening, Nicholas Owen, our Royal Correspondent, and I are staying on the air in place of the scheduled programmes to bring you live coverage of the return to Britain of the body of Diana, Princess of Wales. Prince Charles, who's accompanying the body, is expected to touch down in his aircraft at London's RAF Northolt within the next half an hour. Our reporter, Eric McInnes, is there now. Uh, Eric, I understand that the Prime Minister, Mr Blair, has already arrived there. Yes, the Prime Minister arrived here about half an hour ago, Dermot. In fact, He's actually over on the apron there, uh, talking to some of the press, I believe. He's waiting for uh, the Princess's aircraft to arrive. I spoke to Buckingham uh, Palace officials earlier, and they gave us the schedule of what will happen here. At 7 o'clock, a BAE 146 aircraft of, called the Royal Scot of the Queen's Flight will touch down, carry, carrying the body of Diana, Princess of Wales. On board will be her two sisters and, of course, her former husband, the Prince of Wales. The Prime Minister will meet the group with uh, the Defence Secretary will also be with them. Uh, then the coffin will be brought off by eight coffin bearers and three escorts of the Queen's Colour Squadron. 
they will move silently towards the front of the plane where the coffin will be placed into the hearse. Uh, Buckingham Palace officials are saying that Princess Diana is being afforded the full ceremonials here as is befitting a member, a full member of the royal family. She no longer has the HRH moniker but they're saying that she will have the full ceremonials here. There will be a small ceremony on the apron before the body is taken away in the hearse to a private mortuary somewhere in London. Uh, Eric, quite, uh, quite a gathering there behind you. Any idea who else is there? Sorry, I didn't hear you there, Any Jeremy? idea who else is in that crowd behind you? Well, there's the, all the media, the uh, assembled media there. The Prime Minister is there. The Defence Secretary is there. Uh, the, the Lord Chamberlain is there. Uh, the Lord Lieutenant of London is there. They are the official welcoming committee, uh, and they'll be waiting for the aircraft. As I said, it should be landing here at about 7 o'clock this evening. OK, Eric, thank you very much indeed. We will, of course, be returning to Northolt to bring you live coverage of that event. Well, the plane carrying the body of the Princess of Wales is in the air at the moment. It took off from Paris with Prince Charles on board a short while ago. We will bring, be bringing you some pictures of that very shortly, but first let's uh, go to our Royal Correspondent, uh, Nicholas Owen. Nicholas, uh, I suppose... Um, a sense of expectation, a sense of dreaded expectation. Yeah, yes, absolutely. This plane is going to uh, bring back just about the saddest cargo that's imaginable to this country. And um, then, uh, you know, what, what, what would everybody's feelings? I don't think anybody's quite prepared for uh, how this is going to turn out. Michael Brunson, our political editor, he's with us too here, and he was saying earlier, wasn't he, that, you know, these occasions are always extremely sombre is the word we mustn't overuse that word everything's going to be a bit like that today but certainly this will be in the next uh, Nick, next hour or so. let, let's just have a look now we can now see that uh, BAE 146 from the Royal Flight taking off from Paris yes that's from Villa, Villa Coublet is the name of the military air base and away she goes containing it as half an hour ago containing the body of the princess away it goes back to Britain what a sad Sad, amazing picture there as it goes mm. past the setting sun. Yes. Uh, and as Eric McInnes was telling us, on board uh, Prince Charles, um, Lady Jane Fellows and Sarah McCorkadale, the, uh, the Princess of Wales' sisters. And of course the coffin draped with the royal standard. As Eric McInnes over at Northolt saying, this is being treated as a full royal occasion for the lady who, no longer HRH, that title she lost, but the Queen said she was to be regarded as a member of the royal family and the events of the next week or so are going to prove, I think, that that is absolutely fully the case. The plane almost suspended in the air there. Well, about half an hour ago, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, as we heard, flew into RAF Northolt to await the arrival of Prince Charles with the body of the Princess of Wales. There we have the Prime Minister's flight. He came down this afternoon from his uh, constituency in Sedgefield, caught a flight from uh, Teesside Airport, I believe. There is, you can just see in the distance there, Mr Blair being yeah. greeted by a uh, senior member of the RAF. Uh, the Defence Secretary, George Robertson, uh, to Mr Blair's right. This, uh, as I say, happened about half an hour ago. Mr Blair now waiting on the runway with the, uh, the rest of the assembled party there for the arrival of the flight containing the coffin of the Princess of Wales. We are expecting that flight, as you heard, to arrive in at about 7 o'clock, give or take a few minutes. Very onerous task this is for this well, new I, Prime Minister. I could I, never I, have imagined I wanted this to bring in Michael Brunson, our political editor, is uh, sitting with us in the studio here. Um, as Nick was saying there, Mike, uh, four months into his premiership, what a job for the Prime Minister. Yes, it's truly terrible. We've already seen and heard Mr Blair expressing in very emotional terms this morning, not just his thoughts, but speaking as, of course, the leader of Her Majesty's government. In a sense, he, he does have to speak for everybody in this country. And he was saying that he was devastated. But what is uppermost in his thoughts, I can tell you, is the, is the terrible loss of the promise that there was in what Princess Diana... Mike, we're just getting be. some live pictures in from Northolt. There is the uh, Guard of Honour assembling for the arrival of that, of the Prince of Wales flight from Paris. RAF men who I think will be the pallbearers, will they not? Bareheaded. Are they taking it? 
Yes, there was a, oh eight pallbearers were in uh, RAF men were in Paris to load the coffin onto the hearse from which it was taken, loaded it onto that aeroplane for that sad, sad journey to North Holt. And there is the North Holt contingent, the, their opposite numbers, if you like, being marched out. And uh, they will perform the, the dreadful, dreadful task of carrying that coffin. These, These are, of course, live pigs. It's just yes, live pigs we're seeing. from RAF North Holt. As we were saying earlier, this, 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 this base is specially equipped to deal with royal flights, special security and so forth. It's uh, a place that... Um, Prince Charles is very familiar with. OK, Mike, we, uh, we interrupted you there to, to take those... Well, I was just saying that what is uppermost in Mr Blair's uh, private thoughts, I am told, with those that he's been speaking with during the day, is his sense of this awful, awful loss of a woman who just perhaps was beginning to find a role for herself. Of course, there was a great empathy between Mr Blair and the Princess over this question of landmines. One of the very first things that the government did was to bring in the ban on landmines, which the previous government had decided that it didn't want to go quite that far. And so between the two of them, there was this empathy. But Mr Blair has been talking to friends and sort of saying, look, this woman could, if that kind of thing had gone on, have been such an asset to Britain. And, of course, the other thing that goes through one's mind is that Mr Blair is a young man, too, in his um, coming up to his mid-40s. Princess Diana at 36, the two of them, if you like, represented, did they not, a, a different kind of generation. Mr Blair taking over the start of a younger generation of politicians, Princess Diana, the young figurehead, if you like, for so many people. And all of those aspirations Mr Blair felt were coming forward. And so he felt that after they'd had a meeting at Chequers, not so very far from North Holt, of course, that things would go forward. Both, of course, with two young sons, pretty close in age. And we understand that when there had been those gatherings at Chequers, uh, and, of course, at one of them, um, what Prince William, I think it was, accompanied his mother to Chequers. There was a game of football, I think, that uh, went on. Nick perhaps knows a little bit more about this yeah, than I, I do. And the, the kids were getting on like a house on fire. I think, I think the, the young Blairs and uh, young Royals, were, there was a bit of a kickabout, and uh, the word was that the, uh, the, the Blair boys won, but they're, they're fanatic football fans, aren't they? But it just shows uh, the, the generation thing there. Mr Blair and the Princess, very much of, of that generation, who could get on, get on easily without any great formality. Now, what about the, um, the issue arising out of this privacy? Much discussion now. A huge amount way. of discussion going on. The problem is a privacy law can only restrict what is published. And this is the problem in France. France has the most draconian privacy laws which are very restrictive about what you can publish about people's private and indeed about their public lives. But still, you see, it doesn't deal with the problem of people who gather the news. And these paparazzi are very often foreign people who are operating in different countries, who are publishing in all kinds of, of magazines. How do you deal with that? And the government's feeling is that we've got to wait. We've got to think this through. Yes, it will be at the top of a lot of private agendas, if you like. No rush to sudden legislation. OK, Mike. Well, let's um, return now to uh, RAF Northolt, where we are, of course, expecting uh, within about the next 10 or 15 minutes the, uh, the arrival of uh, Prince Charles's flight from Paris there containing is, the yes. that is coffin obviously the... of his former wife, the Princess of Wales. Sorry, David, I just what are we seeing say, there, Nicholas? Well, no one in this country needs telling what that vehicle in the front is. That's the hearse that will take her coffin to an undisclosed private mortuary somewhere. Behind that will be the car that will contain the Prince of Wales and possibly the princess's two sisters. And behind that, I would guess, a, uh, you know, the security people again, of course, evident all the time. And beyond them, I imagine those, those are press people being lined press, up there. Yeah. So they will be able to see. And the plane will... I imagine from that, to that situation that we, was the aircraft, we will eventually see the aircraft drawing up a short distance away. And as we were saying, there will be um, eight, eight RAF pallbearers, those young men bareheaded, performing that task of carrying the coffin down from the plane. The only recent parallel I can think of is when the Duke of Windsor's body was brought back home at a similar ceremony on the airfield at RAF Benson, also a bleak afternoon, rather like this afternoon. But of course, in a sense, you see, there's no comparison, because there was the Duke, he was an elderly man, now we're seeing others moving forward, there is the pall-bearing party ready. The Duke was an elderly man, had come back after a long life. This is a young woman cut down at 36 years old, which those men that we're now seeing there 
we're going to have to pick up her coffin and carry it across that airfield. Yes, we're told there'll be five wreath bearers, eight coffin bearers and three escorts and all of them will be from the Queen's Colour Squadron. There they are standing silently and stock still awaiting the arrival of the, the Royal Scot, the BAE 146 uh, aircraft that uh, Prince Charles is Those young flying men back home with. Started their military career, this is one job I don't think any of them could conceive in a million years. Who would have who would imagined that we would be seeing that? And we're just moving along now to just going around and seeing what else, you know, everybody awaiting. There's now another airplane sitting there. More RAF men. I think that's there's the police outriders escort. that will accompany the coffin, the Metropolitan Police outriders. Uh, everybody waiting. We've got about 11 minutes or so before that plane is due to And a flag at half mast, as flags all over the country have been at half mast today. As Mike was saying there, Norfolk, the whole country, never really seen anything like this. No, I don't think so. Shock and, shock and grief, all those words, but on an unparalleled scale. OK, well, let's um, catch up with developments perhaps away from uh, RAF Norfolk. Mark Webster has been monitoring what's going on in the ITN newsroom. Let's join him now. Yes, what's extraordinary about having looked at the tributes coming in throughout the day is the extraordinary depth and range. Obviously... Diana, Princess of Wales, touched so many people's lives. I was just talk, looking at some material coming in from Wales, where there was a great deal of affection for her there. Back out, Tony Pandy, the former common speaker, George Thomas, I think, summed up the great sense of loss when he said, close to tears, I'm heartbroken as the rest of the country is. She was held in great affection by everyone in Wales. We have suffered a grievous loss because she was unique. No one ever contained so much compassion and care in one body. It's also true that people have been travelling all the way from Cardiff, bearing little posies, in order to go to Kensington Palace. I presume that people have been coming from all over the country to do the same. Top Welsh rugby stars paid their own personal tribute to the People's Princess, who certainly heavily supported Wales in the Five Nations Championship. Uh, Ex-Wales Captain Robert Jones, recalling how she brought Prince William and Prince Harry to Cardiff Arms Park, said she took on the role of Princess of Wales very fiercely and took a great interest in all achievements in Wales. The lads in the team always had great affection for her, and people used to say we played better when she was watching us. It'll take the world a long time to recover from this disaster and understand just what it's missed. Very much indeed. Well, I can tell you now that we uh, have pictures of the plane carrying the Princess of Wales' body, making its final approach into RAF Northolt. There it is making its slow descent. It's gone through the clouds a few hundred feet from the ground now. Of the Queen's flight. There the we Royal see it. Scott. Indeed. One can only imagine yes. the atmosphere on board that plane. She there is a shot of the awaiting press. Eight, there, mi eight minutes to seven. Down. Eight minutes to seven. She's down. The Princess of Wales returns home. about to see the plane is about to um, be lost to view in a moment we're advised it will go out of sight I'm not sure it's behind a building or what right at the end of the runway there and then taxi back into position yes to hardly seems worth saying but a perfect, perfect landing, landing with such a precious and awful load we were talking just a few moments ago about the happy meetings that uh, had taken place at Chequers and of course this airfield is is quite close to Chequers, a matter of what some 10 miles I suppose or something of that sort the airport is uh, North Old is to the west of London Chequers of course out in the Buckinghamshire countryside you see a bit of that kind of countryside there so all kinds of thoughts will be going through no doubt Tony Blair's mind as he stands on the tarmac there of how it was that he was out in the country home that he he met the princess and now he like everybody else in the country is having to go through this awful moment Nick, as Mike was saying, they're practically all Royal and VIP flights use RAF Norfolk. A lot of them Never do, seen yes. anything sorrier than this. No, indeed not. It's, um, it's a, just a frightful business, isn't it, seeing that plane coming in there? Just, just frightful. As we said, we don't know quite 
where the body are. It's, it's going, going behind, behind the, the control tower. The control tower, there, yeah. yes, an associated building. We'll then presumably turn yes. around. There's mm -hmm. the tailplane. Yeah. We don't quite know where the body is headed. We've not been told that for the moment. And indeed, of course, beyond that, the funeral arrangements are yet to be made. It's being stressed, incidentally, by Buckingham Palace that members of the family will be consulted. And we're not just talking about the royal family. We are, of course, talking about her grieving family, a brother or Spencer, who spoke so passionately. And now we know, just on that, we know that uh, the princess's two sisters are on board the plane. Uh, Earl Spencer is in South Africa, presumably making his way back now. Yes, that's right. Well, he uh, indeed, and he said today, you know, I believe the press would kill her in the end. Those words are going to ring down the ears, aren't they? And the plane stopped there, just a little bit out of view over that ridge. And we're talking about this funeral, as I say, the consultation with the family, whether that means that there's a possibility that it won't be quite the major national event that might have been foreseen, I, I really can't say. I can't imagine, frankly, that it won't be. You remember we saw the coffin in Paris covered with the royal standard. That said it all, it is to be a full royal occasion, uh, and that's likely to involve Westminster Abbey, it's likely to involve, uh, I think, very at St George's Windsor. But when you put that point to royal officials, I said to one of them just now, just before we came on air, what's happening? And they say, quite honestly, we don't know. They do not know where they're going at the moment. It's not surprising, this devastating, unexpected loss. Mike, as we're talking there about the potential arrangements, the period of mourning, what happens to political life? Politics seem totally irrelevant after an event like this. Well, it does seem totally irrelevant, doesn't it? And, of course, it is that sense that has led all the political leaders to announce that they are going to suspend campaigning in the Scottish and Welsh referendum. We are, in a sense, aren't we, into an election-type atmosphere at the moment, but none of them obviously feel that they can possibly go ahead with normal political life, and so there's been an official announcement by Donald Dewar, the Scottish <coughs> Secretary, that he will cease his campaign activities. Mr. Haig uh, is also ceasing his activities. And Mr. Ashdown, too. And the other political leaders in Scotland and Wales, I'm sure, will do exactly the same, and in Northern Ireland as well. The princess, of course, much loved in Northern Ireland. She'd made visits there and so on. We mustn't forget that. And, of course, talking about the funeral, as it was just now, the political leaders will be there, wherever it is, even if it were in a small country church, which I can't imagine it would be, they would want to be there because they are representing us at this particular moment in the sort of things that they are saying and by what they are doing. The House of Commons, of course, in recess at the moment. Is there any discussion of MPs reassembling? No, not at the moment. There is a great feeling, as uh, over the matter, too, of this whole business of legislation over possible privacy uh, uh, and the press. There is a, a, a great feeling. I, I asked Mr Blair, for example, this morning a little bit, or try to, and he said, Michael, just let's leave things for the moment. Let us as it were, get through this. There's, there's no great feeling that the Cabinet wants to rush together. People just want to be quiet. I think Mr Blair, for example, will be going back to Chequers this evening just to be quiet with his family, to be available to anybody who wants to talk to him. He will come into Downing Street early tomorrow morning and he will simply be available as things unfold. One thing we do know is that uh, the Prince of Wales the Prince of Wales is going to be going back to Balmoral immediately tonight once, the, uh, once that body is um, the coffin is unloaded to, to comfort the, the hearse. Princes, yeah he's going straight back to his sons uh, who've uh, needless to say the most dreadful day of their young lives and he's extremely anxious to be back with them there at the moment other Balmoral with the Queen Duke of Edinburgh the Queen Mother um, on on what was a holiday I mean no one's going to call it a holiday at the moment but um, we are now going back to RAF Norfolk there it is making its slow and some would say stately progress towards the party containing the, the Prime Minister amongst them, waiting to... I suppose some welcome isn't the right word. For some reason the plane I stopped. I don't quite know if any, I don't know if any of us know Well, the, the RAF do these things by the book. Uh, they word for any flight. They follow the procedures to the letter. And, of course, in a sense, it makes it all the worse for us now, doesn't it? We, they go through the procedures. There will be this pause. The plane will come very slowly to a stop, and then we shall see the steps taken up, and then the arrangements for the very dignified removal of the coffin. And it will be quiet dignity, but it will be done with a great deal of dignity. A very simple moment, in a sense, but it will be done with dignity. And an image, I suspect, that will haunt the nation for many years to come. Indeed. 
who could think that Diana, Princess of Wales, at the age of 36, would be coming back to this country in a coffin draped with the royal standard? It is a truly awful moment. Nicholas, do we have um, any information on what the, the Queen and Prince Philip are going to do? We don't at all. We, the, the only thing we've heard about them, we've seen them, of course, going to the Crathy yeah. Church. Uh, you know, our, our, our people were there and we, we did see that, see them all going in their cars. And all we heard was the, the, the announcement very early on this morning that they were obviously deeply distressed. There is no more to say, is there? I mean, what else can they add at the moment? Uh, I, I did say much earlier on in the day, I, I, I asked a, a man who's very close indeed to the royal family, has served them for many years. Oh, we're going back now going back to, the plane. to the plane moving round. I was asking him about the relations between, the real relations between Diana and the, the Queen. He said, well, no, no matter what else, the Queen always maintained what he called an open door to Diana. She was always available. And I, I think that whatever the ups and downs of that family's life... Uh, there, the plane just going past the coffin bearers, standing rock steady. Yes. Whatever the up and downs, the ups and downs halt. of life, um, you know, the affection between the Queen and the, the basic affection between the Queen and the Princess of Wales was always there right the way through the bad times. And I think the party containing the Prime Minister is slightly to the right of the plane, you can see a few people just edging their way forward there. That presumably the spot where the plane is going to come to its final halt. Apart from the, uh, the RAF dignitaries that are there, of course the Prime Minister were also told that we have seen there, George Robertson, the Defence Secretary, is there. The Lord Chamberlain is the head of the Queen's household and the Lord Lieutenant of London. As part of Royal Protocol, he will be there too. And now that, that, that is a long shot. There's Mr Blair, the Prime Minister, standing in the middle of that group, containing the people I just mentioned. There, they're coming forward now. We can just, I don't know if you just heard it there, the plane's engines were just cut. There's the very sad sight of the hearse moving forward. That cut of engines, Michael was talking about the precision precisely ten minutes after landing. There, uh, you can see the white gloves of the three escorts moving forward now. Shortly, the steps will be <coughs> brought up to the plane. The doors will open. And, of course, presumably, we shall see Prince Charles standing on the tarmac having to watch this. We've been talking about what's going through Mr Blair's mind. He's been waiting at Northolt, but we no doubt will now... See in a minute or two, Prince Charles coming from the They're plane. The Paul Bearers oh, advancing so now. That very slow, deliberate march. Taking them towards the cargo part, I have to say, that's what it is of the plane. It's a closer shot. Approaching the back of the plane. the saddest duty that has ever been performed at RAF Northolt. Those young RAF men will remember this for the rest of their lives. We will too, don't we? Absolutely. Just shuffling up there, absolute precision, as you were describing, Mike. Yes, I think what we're seeing there is what I was saying earlier about the quiet dignity of this. <coughs> There is the Prince of Wales now, and with him behind... Ah, we've moved away from it, but that was the Prince of Wales, obviously, with well, the, the sisters the, of, the, of the princess. The coffin being unloaded from another part of the plane. And here it there comes. There we have a glimpse of it. Just saw a wreath there, I think, caught a glimpse of some white lilies being carried past. Such beautiful flowers, such a beautiful aroma always from them. 
coffin lifted onto those broad shoulders. And carried the short distance to the awaiting hearse. Down smartly and the slow march about to begin. Again, all this intricate ceremony that Michael Branson talked of, this is all planned to the last detail, this sort of thing could be, I suppose, for any dignitary, but in this case it's for the most important dignitary of all ever, I would say, to be carried from a British plane on British soil, the awful homecoming of Diana, Princess of Wales, her coffin covered by the royal standard, now on its way across the tarmac towards the hearse. Coffin bearers just going out of sight of that camera, our other camera at the scene just picking them up now as they approach the hearse. Carried out in almost complete silence, just a light breeze rippling the flag there on the coffin. Yes, I suppose if you were there you'd hear just that faint scraping of the boots across the tarmac. I don't think we hear much at all apart from the distant hum of traffic reminding us that London is not far away. Busy world still going on somewhere. They're the party containing the Prime Minister. I didn't catch sight of uh, the Prince of Wales there, Nick. I don't know if he is standing beside him. He is, I'm told he is. He's there, something, yes. so to the back of the hearse. Ah, yes, there is Prince Charles, the very far right of that group, yes. standing beside one of Princess Diana's sisters. Yes. Mr Blair, roughly in the middle. contrast could hardly be greater, could it, of the, between this and the recent pictures that we've been seeing of the princess and her various holidays, her various cruises, whatever the problems with the paparazzi and the press, and they started several days, several weeks ago. There was a woman who seemed just to be having some fun and some enjoyment in life, and we have to contrast that now with, with these incredibly sombre pictures, the silence of it making it in a sense worse, I think. Indeed. An unbelievable sight. Some 19 hours now after the dreadful car accident in Paris, which claimed the life both of the princess, her new friend Dodie Fired, driver of the car, an accident being blamed by many people on the activities of paparazzi, unofficial cameramen, desperate for one picture 
which they can sell for so much money. Clearly the events of last night are going to be gone over again and again and again until we get to the bottom of exactly what happened. But right now, our thoughts clearly with those people standing there, particularly the Prince of Wales, particularly the young princes. Indeed, the young princes in Balmoral. In Balmoral. And we should perhaps mention there also the two sisters of the Princess of Wales, who we can also see yes. in that lineup. Yes. It's um, Lady Jane Fellows and Sarah McCorkadale. Sarah McCorkadale it was who first went out with the Prince of Wales and introduced him to the woman who was to be his bride. A marriage which, as we all know, lasted 15 years and ended in divorce. She'd just begun starting a new life, as far as we could tell, with Dodie Fired. It did seem, whatever the controversies about it, a happy life. It's every sign that she was enjoying herself. The smile definitely returned. There, the, the princess's sister's coming forward, yes. going in the car immediately behind the hearse. Yes. To follow on in a, in a yes. grim cortege. That is one of the royal cars, is it not, uh, Nick? Yes. One of the fleet of royal cars, yep. which shows that from the very beginning, from her return to this country, she's been treated as a member of the royal family. Yes. Now, Nick, do we suspect that the prince will actually stay at Northolt and, and fly on up now to Balmoral to be with his sons? I presume so, Dermot. I have to say I can't quite see him in that group now, but whether he's moved well, slightly he to one side... He didn't seem get into that get car, into that car no. with Diana's sisters. plan is for him to go straight back to Balmoral now to comfort his sons, William 15, Harry 12, seeing their mother taken away uh, and, and snatched away from them. And where is that hearse? Uh, I don't we don't know, Dermot, we don't know. Private mortuary is all we've been told. It now leaves RAF Northolt, the police outriders clearing the way, as if anybody would want to get in the way. Everybody in that group just peering out over the tarmac of the airport as it, they drive off somewhere into the British countryside. We often wonder how people must be feeling, but uh, I think we wouldn't be too far wide of the mark if we said they're clearly stunned. There's the Prince of Wales. He's moving along, I think, the line, if I'm not much mistaken. I oh, know, is it him? Yes, I think he is talking to the people in, in the line. Yes. There he is, yes. Yes, yes he was just obscured there by He's one of the heads. Yes. Wind. That, I think, of the Red we Cassock is probably one of the Queen's chaplains, is it I not? I would imagine, uh -huh. yes, probably. I'm afraid we can only see backs of heads, but it's a little difficult to... Uh, I don't know. I know you can see the Prince of Wales there, right in the middle of our shot. His face looking, you know, he's had a couple of weeks up in Balmoral. He's always a relaxed holiday there. Things were going well for him, as far as one could tell, and with the, his sons. And, uh, and, of course, things were going well in her own terms with Diana, enjoying the holidays that Michael talked about. A lot of holidays lately. A lot of people will now say, well, she did deserve them. dignity he's carrying out his duties with, with that prospect of going home now to, to talk to his sons, to comfort them, to offer them solace, to try to explain what's happened. And there'll be a word of thanks there, I think, to the RAF. That's the, obviously the commanding officer, I would uh, imagine, from Northolt. Prince Charles just stopping to have a word, yes. no doubt, to say thank you for the dignified way in which that bringing forward of the coffin and transferring to the hearse was carried out. Back to your precision, Michael. I made that 20 minutes exactly from landing to the hearse leaving the gates. And there the Prince of Wales walks away. Back, back onto to the, the plane, plane, straight plane back which on. will head back to Aberdeen. Another word for an RAF man. Whether he will get straight on, or I, I, I imagine he will. I There's no point very hanging around, to is there? Back there. No. Swiftly on to Balmoral. How long does it Past take the... to get from Aberdeen to Balmoral? Uh, in that aircraft, about, I would think, I'm trying to work it out, about an hour and a half. I'd probably 
proved completely wrong by aeronautical experts, but I think it's about an hour and a half. It's quite a long way up to Aberdeen, you know. I went up there the other day. It's a, it's a long old haul. And from Aberdeen, he will transfer to a car. He drove himself to the airport in Aberdeen this morning, uh, with a police escort behind, of course, but drove himself down the twisting, winding road that goes through the village of Ballater down Royal D side, such a beautiful part of Scotland. No, just the young pallbearers, the honour guard marching off. I was struck by that news that he drove himself. It sometimes is therapy, isn't it, in cases yes. like this, to do something, get, get on, to absolutely. feel that you're, you're going, yes. that he's going to Paris, that he's yes. doing something. Yes. I imagine that was perhaps the thought. It would have been yes. easy enough for someone to drive him, but... Just that feeling in moments yeah. like this, I think people always want to say, I'm going to do something, I'll drive myself. Indeed. So we shall shortly hear those jet engines start up again. And the plane will then turn to carry the Prince of Wales back to his beloved Balmoral, a place Diana never liked. She never enjoyed it up there in Scotland, I'm afraid. More, more to her taste of the Mediterranean sunshine. But they've had a lot of sun at Balmoral. I have to say, the weather when I was up there a couple of weeks ago was positively Mediterranean. There's the whole door still open oh, yes. on the plane. That dislike of Balmoral, Nick, uh, part, surely, of what she referred to in the, in the Panorama interview, wasn't it? That as far as the establishment was concerned, it struck home today, didn't it? The difficulties that there were. We've talked about the happiness, but the difficulties that there were that she felt that the establishment never accepted her. Politicians somehow could get on with her, but there were grave difficulties with the, what she called the establishment and the courtiers. And there we see Mr Blair. George Robertson. And George the Robertson, the Defence Secretary, waiting for the departure of the Prince's flight back to Balmoral. There will obviously be consultation between Number 10 and the Palace and many other people besides, uh, starting already, I'm sure, tonight and above all tomorrow about the steps forward now and above all, of course, about the arrangements for the funerals and who will go, which politicians will be there, the leaders will obviously be there, but what does the Cabinet do? How does the Cabinet show its respect? How do other members of other parties show their respect as well? Well, we're also hearing that there are obviously many, many world figures who want to attend Indeed. this funeral, Hillary Indeed. Clinton amongst them, so a huge logistical and organisational task ahead. That's why I think it's the chances are that that funeral will not be this week, if we regard Sunday as the first day of the week. Uh, I fancy it will probably push into the week after. Uh, the amount of organisation, as you say, is absolutely vast. But we mustn't take anything for granted on this uh, business of the funeral. Uh, Buckingham Palace are making it very clear that there are no decisions made as yet. A family to be consulted, and as I said before, that family is, uh, you know, quite a lot of them around. And princess's mother to be consulted, of course, her brother and her sisters and other people too. And perhaps, too, her sons will have their say. I'm sure they will. That's how Diana has brought them up, to have minds of their own. To We heard earlier from somebody from one of her charities talking about taking her sons to see the work of that charity at first and see the young homeless. That was the sort of mother she was. She didn't want them wrapped up in uh, the flummery of royal life, if you like, remote from the people. She had no intention of that. She wanted them to know what life was about. And now I regret to say they found out what death and is about. We heard too, of course, about how fast maturing Prince William has been. Yes. He, he's been a great support to his mother over the years. He's obviously felt very, very close to her. That so often happens when there are you know, this younger son, a bit of a scamp and, 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 and so on, but the older boy, very, very sensitive and uh, often provided a help to his mother. I mean, I don't mean help in the sort of literal sense, or maybe that too, I mean, you know, probably that, but, but, but an emotional prop to some extent. And again, some people criticise the princess for that. But, you know, this is repeated in households up and down the land. That's, that's how families have to get on with it. When there's a divorce, it's terrible for everyone concerned. Everyone has to pitch in and play their part, and Prince William has done so. Let's just remind people who are perhaps just tuning in the, the scene we're seeing in front of us. It's uh, the runway apron at RAF Northolt. There you can see the Prime Minister Tony Blair, flanked by his Defence Secretary George Robertson, who have just 
greeted, if that's the right word, the Prince of Wales as he bought his wife's, his former wife's coffin back to Britain. They are now just waiting for the Prince to close up his plane on the Royal Flight, close the doors and take off once again to head north to Balmoral to be with his sons. Yes, there is the delicate problem, isn't there, that under normal circumstances the Queen does not attend funerals, but it would be inconceivable, wouldn't it, that she would not be present at the funeral of Diana. She was at the Duke of Windsor's funeral, wasn't she? I presume she was. I believe she was, as yes, a family funeral, so funeral. it will have to be that yeah. mix, will yes. it not, of a family funeral and a national funeral, if not a state funeral. But of course, as you say, heads of government from around the world no doubt wanting to come. So it's a delicate matter as to how the balance is pitched. You're a helicopter here, somewhere. Yes, I a helicopter that's hovering that's overhead. Police helicopter, I would imagine, making sure that uh, there are no unwanted intruders into this scene. Of course, the prince himself, a bit of a pilot, and but he had a bit of an upset uh, yeah, yeah. in the Highlands a few years ago. He, it's not mince words here. He wrote off a rather expensive aeroplane and he apparently turned around to everyone and said after us, well, OK, that's it. I, I have to admit, that's not... My flying days perhaps are over. He loves, he, he, he loves, uh, loves flying and uh, did his flying in his time in the military, in the Navy. We well, were talking about him driving earlier, but I, I doubt he's going to be at the controls mm. at this time. I think he will want to use the time, won't he, going up to Balmoral to collect his thoughts of what are going to be some very difficult days ahead. Indeed. I would imagine too, Mike, if I was on that aircraft, it'll have very sophisticated apparatus on it. It's not like most of these aeroplanes. You're not allowed to do this and not allowed to do that on the electronic side. You know, I'm sure there'll be a phone. I'm sure he well, will he, be ringing yes. his sons. He can talk. He can, he can talk to his sons. He can talk to all the people that he would want to discuss matters with. And we saw the way there that... Um, he had a word with not just the commanding officer, but the captain, the, the, the commander or the NCO, whoever it was, of the guard that took the coffin off as before he left to get on the plane. He had a word with him. I imagine there'll be a lot of talking. He'll use the time on the aircraft. There we can just see the pilot in the cockpit of the plane making his final preparations for takeoff. The flight checks that they always go through, every aeroplane. Again, carrying passengers must do. By the book. There they go. Yes, I think we can clearly see that the there, I think Prince of Wales is not out of the controls. Yes, no. there's the whine of the engines. Engines on. Engines going. It is just confirmed that they are heading for Aberdeen. The Prince will then make the short trip by road from Aberdeen to Balmoral. Not so short. 50 miles. <laughs> And it can be quite a trip too, actually. They're a pretty winding roads, so... Um, but if you're the Prince of Wales, the traffic tends to be kept a bit out of the way. It's a journey he's made so many times. Other members of the Royal Family, of course, made so many times. We mentioned Diana not liking, uh, not liking uh, Balmoral, but whether that was largely as a result of the environment she found herself in, perhaps in other circumstances, she'd have loved it as much as so many holidaymakers who go there. When, when they're great, the thing that strikes you about Balmoral is, is how very sort of friendly everybody is up there, how many holidaymakers there are everywhere, all nations of the earth represented coming on off of coaches and everybody. When I was there, everybody would come off the coach and come up to me in various languages and sorts of English and say, who will be seeing the Queen, who will be seeing... And the chances are, yes, you have to say to them, well, you hang around, probably will, she'll come out of that gate and she may try to, you know, go into the ballot or... It's a very, very friendly, very friendly place. Uh, it's a pity that, of course, now that um, Diana didn't find it so. I wonder if that precision that uh, Michael's, he was quite right to alert us to it. Every time I look at my watch, landing at 6.51, everything else happened at sort of 10 minute intervals. So. You see there the chops being taken away oh, from right. the, the front of the plane. Well, as we were saying, it's always done by the book. If the RAF take a minute or two longer than commercial flights, well, that is the way the... Ah. But uh, it was very fitting, wasn't it? It was. It was. Somehow the weather, you know, it's, it's, a, it's obviously quite a nice evening, actually, quite a sunny, 
gentle sort of evening. That in a way is sort of part of off she goes. Yeah, Seven twenty four in the evening. Sunday, August the thirty first, the Prince of Wales departs to Aberdeen, as we keep saying. Yes, a gentle English end of summer evening. Some quarter of an hour ago, the body of Diana, Princess of Wales, taken off that plane by the RAF pallbearers into the hearse and away with her sisters in the car behind, just as every other family has to endure when there's a funeral. The family rides behind, the family wondering what happens next, what happened, how did it all happen, who was to blame, all those terrible things. They've gone off one way, and now the plane turns on the tarmac at RAF Northolt and it prepares to head northwards. The Prince, of course, flew to Paris with the Princess of Wales sisters. They went off behind the hearse. Uh, he's pretty much alone on that plane now. Would he have a few advisers with him? Yes, he will, yes. I, I, I think he'd probably have his um, private secretary with him and his press secretary and people like that. They tend to... And Mr Blair is still waiting there mm -hmm. just to see the plane take off. Then he'll be on his way back home to, to his family at Chequers. As Mike was saying, not very, not very far away for him. Down to check I it. think also the, the, the fact that we saw the sisters there but are now, of course, we don't know where they have gone, it underlines, doesn't it, the point that Earl Spencer was making, that they must now be allowed time to, to mourn, I think he said, their own flesh and blood. And so we have the contrast there where we are looking here at the Prince of Wales plane or we're looking again at the Prime Minister and uh, George Robertson there, but uh, there's the other side of it, there's the... The, the, the Spencer family side of it. Yeah, the plane slowly taxiing to the end of the runway before takeoff. Of course, you were talking also about the people who are being affected by all this. We mentioned the family, we mentioned the government, we mentioned the country. But of course, one thought that goes through my mind is all the charities that uh, Princess Diana had begun to work for again. Uh, she, she talked, didn't she, about retreating from private life and cutting right down just to one or two, but gradually, gradually she's been taking up more of that role in, in national life. And that, I think, is underlined by the national outpouring of mourning. That well, we've during the course of the day, we talked with quite a few of the, uh, the charities that uh, the Princess had been closely involved with, uh, and they would have one voice. They were adamant that as a lasting legacy to the Princess, that they would redouble their efforts, that whatever she had achieved, they would go on to achieve more. There, the plane from the Royal Flight that has brought Diana, Princess of Wales, back to Britain, now containing just the Prince of Wales, turning slowly to head shortly into the skies as the Prince of Wales makes his way back to Balmoral to be with his sons, with Diana's sons, the Princes William and Harry. Well, we'll shortly be coming to the end of our live coverage of the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. We first went on the air at about three o'clock this morning when we first learned that Princess Diana had suffered serious injuries in a late-night car crash. It was some time later that doctors at a Paris hospital confirmed the, the devastating truth that she'd actually died. Since then, we brought you the, the terrible events as they've unfolded throughout the day. And they culminated this evening in the sight of the coffin carrying the body of Diana, Princess of Wales, being lifted off that plane from Paris, that plane which is now taking off. The final sorrowful confirmation of the bitter and unexpected blow that the royal family and the whole nation suffered today. While we're now drawing to a close, you can see full coverage of the death and remarkable life of the Princess of Wales in a special programme with Trevor MacDonald on ITV at 9 o'clock. Goodbye.